begin. Right. Welcome, one and all, to the final week of the um, Shiny uh, Outstanding User Interfaces with Shiny book club uh, that we've been running through the Arthur Data Science community um, you know, through the Slack channels and things like that. Um, if you are watching on YouTube or anything like that and you've managed to make it to this, the 28th chapter of the book, um, I, I applaud you. Um, there are many other book clubs that we run through the community uh, on shiny development our development data analysis in, in general and you are more than welcome to join the slack community and join in with that um part of our world um okay so today the chapter that we're working through it's quite a big chapter it's about um using um the tools that the modern web developer would use um while developing a shiny app the app there's an application that's developed during a chapter which to all intents and purposes has very little r code in it um so it's a, sh a shiny app where the user interface is defined using um the um, the JSX syntax, which we covered last week when we were talking about React. Um, it doesn't actually use React in this chapter, but the JSX syntax, there's a way of converting files that contain JSX into uh, more typical JavaScript stuff when using the framework 7 uh, toolkit that... that we talked about a few weeks ago for developing, you know, mobile ready applications. I have made a package that contains the preliminary stuff, the like the R specific code. And I'm hoping to add in some of the JavaScript code as we go along today. But when I've live coded this kind of stuff before, it hasn't always worked particularly well. Um, so there may be some hiccups, but I'll take you through the chapter anyway. Um, so, um, right. So, th so the purpose here, we're we're building a an application that displays um, uh, a, a kind of a a well-known dynamical system called the Van der Poel oscillator. Um, so it shows um, the X and Y um, variables. You know the, the position of of your uh, of a um, path through the Van der Poel oscillator with time in one plot and it also shows a phase plane analysis of 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 this um yeah anyway um so let's talk about that so the but the purpose of the chapter i'm an r developer um arthur i i assume your main development experience has been in r possibly in a data analysis setting as well yeah. um yeah and um but there are a great many experienced web developers out there who could work wonders on shiny applications um but um shiny was kind of initially devised as a way to make um you know dashboard type things uh for presentation on the web in a way that meant that you didn't necessarily need to know javascript and css and html you could write everything in r and present it to the world and voila you you have a, a web application if you're a a more typical web developer you probably don't shiny might not even be on your horizon it might not be something you've even heard of and f fitting your knowledge into a 
into an existing shiny app might be quite quite a challenge if if everything is already written in an R. Um, anyway, so um, so the chapter starts with a look at an app that was um, entered into the shiny contest from presumably 2021, possibly 2020. Um, and it's a, like, it's, um, it is a shiny app, but it uses uh, loads of kind of JavaScript plotting and mapping um, libraries. And um, it was built using HTML templates and, and things. The, the kind of thing that we have been learning how to construct within within this book, you know, HTML templates for use in Shiny. Um, yes, so, um, right, so, so the, so the purpose of the chapter is to explain how you can write the kind of backend logic for an app using Shiny, have a tiny amount of kind of connecting code that's written in R that connects your Shiny application to a front end, which is almost entirely written in JavaScript, HTML, CSS. So we're no longer writing the, the, the UI in R um, in, in this chapter, but there's a lot of tools that you need in order to do that. Um, so um, during the book, we've been, um, you know, we've been writing quite a bit of JavaScript. Um, and there are various flavors of JavaScript and not all of them are ready to run directly in your browser um so if you are using things like the import syntax and and various other niceties that are common in modern javascript you need a kind of a, a build tool that will take your many javascript scripts and convert them into a version of javascript to a single file a ver in a version of JavaScript that is compatible with uh, more uh, browsers. Um, and there is a tool called Packer that um, it, it, this is an R package Packer, which builds upon a, a more well known tool set called Webpack. Um, Webpack is like a, a, a well known kind of front end tool for converting. Um, Russ, I think you muted yourself and moving the uh, uh, little. Um, Sorry about that. Selector, no worries. Um, yes, so um, Packer is, uses Webpack. Webpack is a tool for, you know, constructing um, uh, a JavaScript code base from, you know, for converting a JavaScript code base into a different form um, so that it's usable so that in uh, in the browser we are going to be using packer which is an r package for interacting with webpack and we're going to be building a golem app so this is going to be an r package that we're constructing um packer and golem work quite nicely together to be honest so um it's it's actually um quite neat how how this works together and um myself and you arthur we did the JavaScript for our book last year. Packer is discussed towards the end of that. Um, towards the end of that uh, book, uh, and they also talk about the the the, the Golem scaffolding uh, functions in there as well. Um, to use these two tools, you just have to install them, much like you would any other R package. So I've I've already done that, and I've got a package here um which i have kind of pre-populated so i'll get the git commits so 
Um, I've got basically this is kind of a uh, a kind of um, Frankenstein package in some ways. You have things that would be typical in a JavaScript package. Uh, yeah, package, I think is the right word. And things that would be more typical in an R um, package, all kind of smashed together. Um, the R stuff was added using um, using create golem. I named it slightly differently, but it, you know, it, it, I don't think that will make any difference in in the 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 subsequent stuff. Um, so you create Golem that adds a new package in your file system and then opens it up in our studio if you if you're one of those kind of people and um and then packer scaffold golem will add things like these webpack configs here the source js um directory where you'd write your javascript code your your kind of unbundled javascript code and and various other things you 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 kind of package dependencies and stuff like that are all added by Packer. Okay, so we've got to that point and we have the structure depicted here. Um, yeah, so we've got some files for configuring JavaScript, some files that are typical of an R package. Um, and uh, we are actually, we're going to be using Framework 7 in this project and there is actually a way to um scaffold a golem app such that it already has um the dependencies on framework 7 linked in but i didn't use that here um so at present having done that um um workflow i have um the following dependencies added on the javascript side just webpack itself and the command line interface and things um so nothing so framework 7 isn't mentioned and es charts isn't mentioned which is something else that's going to be used as well uh, i should probably mention that um this is the um nonlinear ode system that we're going to be looking at here um and the author says you know if you are interested in um dynamical systems like this he, he provides a link to some book i've done quite a bit of ode stuff in the past um and yeah so it it's like it's quite you know it's quite interesting but i have called my package Vanderbol rather than Vanderpol, um, just to amuse myself and my um, interests in mathematical biology that date back a few decades. Um, right, anyway, um, so user interface. What do we need here? We um, This is a, a, a system, so you've got an X variable, a Y variable, and implicitly you've got time in 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 this pair of equations too there's one parameter mu that um dictates um the properties of this system um as you vary mu you get different stability points and different behavior of the the, the system and, and whatnot um so we want to be able to provide the user a way to modify that parameter and as they modify that parameter we're going to update the phase plane and we're going to update the um the the, the kind of trajectory plot the the time plot of, of of these two x and y variables um yes so um yeah 
uh, so yeah, we're going to make two plots. We're going to have a slider input, and that's basically what the app's going to look like. I, I I'm not going to guarantee that I'm going to be able to finish this in the time, um, but I I just want to get some of the code working um, that that links the framework seven side of this with the shiny application um yeah uh where are we yes so so here we've actually got two different styles of javascript work going on here we've got framework 7 to handle the look and feel of the user interface and we've got eCharts js to present the graphics the the phase plane and the uh, time plot um yeah so for us um the the chapter starts by talking about the um how to solve these equations in r using a kind of numerical integration tool um and how we design the r code to make it relatively easy for a user to pass in a value of mu and compute the the you know the phase plane values and, and things like that and it it boils down to this you you define two equations this is um if you look at the original equations you've got um da, 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 where are we equations here um time derivative of x is the value of y and the time derivative of y is this quadratic well this um kind of uh, not quadratic what would it be um this you know e equation involving both x and y so time doesn't enter into the um equations that define the dynamics of the system um and that the string that we just looked at here we've got this is the time derivative for x and this is the time derivative for y written in a format that i probably wouldn't have expected to see in r so this is written rather than as a function it's written as a kind of um string that will be passed and evaluated and, and things the the code I, I i i wouldn't have written the r code like like it's presented in this um chapter myself but like you know it's it's fine so um so what we've got these are the equations defining the system um in addition to them you need a, a kind of initial point from that initial point as time progresses you can see the dynamics of, of the system um but in order to see the dynamics you need to be able to solve the differential equations in order to do that you pass in an initial time an initial position and a sequence of time values and the definition of your model and any parameters that are required in that model so this is how we pass in mu is 0 0.5 and then uh, on another occasion we might pass in mu is two yeah um so this is how our shiny app user is gonna end up getting their new value of mu passed into this model this solves those odes um here it's not a package i'd ever used in r before i've never really done um numerical integration in r really um well not without it being done for me by um internals um but uh yeah so that's just solving some odes um so we've got the initial condition, the time, the model, and the parameters. This here um, is 
how we convert those equations that are specified as strings, how we convert those into a kind of R model of the differential equations that can be passed into this um, um, integration package. Um, so what it's doing is taking those strings and converting them into um, the you know the symbolic version of the same thing. Um, so we've got our model. We've got a way of solving the model. Um, if I load up um, my package and then do solve model, it should give me the same stuff. So it's starting at 1.1 one, one and then progressing. Um, yeah. Okay, um, so we're going to make a plot in our app that shows how the x variable changes over time and how the y variable changes over time. I think it's shown on the same axis. Um, this function here, the purpose of that is to um, work out for every position on a kind of x, y plot where, which direction would um, the a dynamical system sitting at that point be heading next? So this is like how you build that phase plane data for the um, things. I've stuck that into the into the uh, package already, um, and we can I can show you this, but it's not necessary really. Um, yeah, so this just shows uh, x and y. The speed in the x direction is this, the speed in the y direction is this, and the speed overall is that. Um, so that gives us, that function gives us a, a matrix with which we can build a phase plane for presentation in the app. Um, so we've got all those functions all together, and then we have this kind of uber function that calls all of those again this this really isn't how i'd have structured the the code a lot of things seem to be embedded inside it that sh I, I would have thought should be passed in so like if you wanted to provide the user the ability to change the initial position you would now have to go into this function and modify within the body of this function rather than just passing in the initial points as part of the parameters. Um, similarly, if you wanted to change the length of time over which this is integrated, you'd have to go in and modify the function. But, you know, it works. It's fine. So we've got a handful of our functions all in... Um, a single file, model.r. No reactivity, no UI stuff or anything like that's been written yet. Um, so that's, they're referring to that as the business logic of this app, which makes sense, I guess. Um, and that's basically, that is basically all we need. It's not, though. It's not. That's what we need to solve those equations and to work out the trajectories in the phase plane for that specific set of equations. Um, in order to present that to a user, you'd need an application and we haven't even got the bare bones of an application yet. So um, what we're gonna do is we look into app, the app, uh, the the server side code, and we have the parameters are some reactive that takes an input from the user and sticks it in a vector, and then that collection of parameters is passed into that generate model data, the big function that we just looked at. 
um, this is the time over which we're going to be integrating. These are the parameters that we've got from the user. And yeah, and I think that's that's basically the server side logic for the whole app. So by pushing all that, the kind of business logic into functions that have no reactive content, we we're at a we we start from a really simple baseline shiny app, um, and like extracting functions out of out of a reactive context is really really helpful when you're building shiny apps. But um, anyway, so uh, yes, so there's an observe event, right? So that's what we've done as the R developer. We've done our bit. We we've solved those equations. We've provided a reactive um a, a way to pass um parameters from the user to the server side of, of of the r a way to generate the model data and and here what we're doing is we are sending a message to the browser to say here's some new model data update your update your graphs but we haven't written any of the code for like updating those graphs or anything like that. And this is where it's all going to fall apart. Cause this is <laughs> as far as I got when I was like working through this before I got like attacked by infants yesterday. Um, right. So what we haven't done is define any of the JavaScript dependencies that we need in the running app. Um, any of the tools apart from web pack uh, that we need to um construct the 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 browser's version of the javascript from um the the developer's version of the javascript we haven't written a single line of javascript yet okay so we'll do all of that now i think um i'll see if i can, if I can... right so um so as is typical you define your dependencies first and the tools we're going to be using are well these are already defined for us by by the packer package we also want to install these tools so this is babel which is um a, a kind of builder um so that's something that will convert new style javascript into browser style javascript um so we'll run that code and that's going to update our package.json will get json will get updated as we is that done Dev dependencies, or maybe I'll... yeah, that's got updated there. So the Babel tools have been added. Now we're going to add Framework Seven for the user interface and eCharts for the graphics, and they'll get added as uh, production dependencies into the same thing. Uh, so we should end up with the package.json looking like this. The versions have all moved on, but I don't think that will matter too much. Um, if it does, I'll just borrow their package.json. And, and... Um, anyway, so now they use some terminology which I hadn't heard before, and... Um, and I had to go searching for it. They refer to um, this file, loader.json. Um, Packer has a function called use loader rule. Loaders, that's a webpack terminology. Um, these are um, things for pre-processing file. If you've got a JavaScript file that contains JSX, it needs to be processed before that can be 
viewed as legal JavaScript. Um, so there's a load of rule for doing that in Webpack. Similarly, if you need, uh, I think, uh, what are the other ones that uh, mentioned in here? Style loader, CSS loader, framework seven loader. Yeah, so there's a, a tool for kind of, um, you know, building a project that's based on framework seven as well. These are just rule uh, loaders are just kind of rules that are applied by Webpack and they're defined in a config um, that's caught that looks like that. Um, so we're going to add that and that gives us a way of um, building our project of, of including CSS files into our project. Um, so we'll run that. Ooh, hold on. Sorry, Russ, to come back to the, the loader bit, um, it, it, is it basically like what orchestrate, is it responsible for like orchestrating the lo loading of these external files, like the order in which they're loaded, or is there is there more to it than that? I, do, I don't think, I don't think it's so much th that as, um, as a, 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 a tool for kind of, um, for for the building step of your project for like um assembling your kind of final bundled version of your project from okay. the files that uh so for 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 example like um i guess you wouldn't want to kind of deploy to the web your non minified CSS yes. or like yeah, non-minified yeah. JavaScript. So it's basically seeing where to find the 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 stuff to deploy. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Got it. Thanks. Um so I've just run that, which should change this file. Where are we? Source JS config loaders. Yeah, so we, we've got a, a, a rule for um for I, I find the use of test inappropriate to be honest but um um any css file that's found will have this rule applied to it and then this rule applied to it um when building your project there's a framework 7 loader now you can you can write jsx syntax outside of a react project so long as it's in a framework 7 oh, sorry in a framework 7 project you can write jsx syntax and you don't have to actually depend on react to to do that you can actually convert that code into you know legal javascript using a framework 7 loader so that's another kind of um i think it it depends on something called preset react which is a kind of trimmed down version of react i think anyway um so we'll add that in that's something that will shake our jsx into um a more reasonable form. Um, so if we then look here, we have this. Hmm, I think. There might be too many backslashes in that. First. CSS and that. I think here. It should be a single backslash because that's a regex for delimiting this dot here. There probably should be a backslash there as well. This is when I modify files because I think I'm doing the right thing and then find that everything falls apart. Um, so any file that looks like f7.js or f7.jsx will be passed through this rule and then this rule. 
um, before being bundled into the, the final project. Um, so we are there. And there's also, there's another config required. Getting used to where config should go and how many there are is is like the main kind of pain point I have when I work with any anything JavaScripty. Um, so we've got which one's Babel? Babel's I can't remember exactly which one Babel is. It's for um, anyway. We'll we'll just copy what they um, require. So we can make a file called dot babel rc. Hold on. Um, and inside it, we'll put this. Okay, now. Now, what have we done since I last checked in any code? We have added our dependencies. We have modified the rules that Webpack will apply to our JavaScript and CSS code. And we've added a config for Babel. So we should be able to um, bundle this code up. Now that should make, I don't know where it goes. I think it's in app dub. It'll probably bundle an index.js into here. Failed to bundle. What's going on here? Failed to load webpack.prod.js. Bad escape character. So maybe <laughs> uh, it sounds. It does sound like it's my own fault. That my own possibly hubris. <laughs> All right, let's try it again. Um, I'll convert it back to what it was. So it, originally it looked like that. Let's try that again. Oh no, it's still running. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, so the packages know what they're doing better than I, so we'll we'll just um we'll lean into them um right, so well, let's that... recognize that uh that escape <laughs> characters are always tricky, uh you know, like the x k c d comic like an escape character to escape the escape, and you know yeah. oh. yes, um. Working with R on Windows, there was always pain points along that. Like, did it, like you know, I, I think it's changed recently. Recently, but like ten years ago, you used to have to, in order to specify file paths as a, a, as one long string, you'd have to escape the forward slashes and things like that, and everything looked ridiculous when it was. Anyway, right. Anyway, let's do run app. It's working. Um, okay, so okay, so it works. Um, but it works, but it's not doing anything that we actually want it to yet. Um, so it's always good to see that you know your bundled code runs at least, but we want to get some additional stuff in here. We want to get our graphs we want to get our slider in i think it's the slider that they deal with first basic our ui skeleton so um ba -ba -ba -ba. yes framework 7 has some expectations there should be a element with the id app in it somewhere and inside that the framework 7 code goes i think 
if I remember rightly from five chapters ago. So we'll change our user interface, the one that Gollum added um, uh, UI. So we have UI request title equals no. So where's it going to get its title from? Anyway, we'll just assume that they know what they're doing. Now, why do you go and then we have to update this to to use to ensure that um a bunch of metadata is added as well um so this is like to make sure that things look right on different devices and, and whatnot um I, I i can't um explain precisely why these are the things that need to be done but we're gonna assume That they know what they're doing, right? Um, but yeah, so this is like handling working on a um, iPhone and, and things. Yes. Da, da, da. Yeah. So that's all we need in R, because everything else is going to be written in J in in JSX. Um, yeah, that will add an element to the app. And inside that app, JavaScript's going to inject content. Um, I, wonder, I don't know whether it will actually run at the moment. Let's see. It might not work, actually. But yeah, it looks like there's very little. Yeah, we've got an element with the app thing. We just have to write some code to get into that. Um, so what we've got um, in, ah, yes. So in source.js, in, is it index.js? This is the file, the, the kind of the entry point, really for bundling the code. Any code that's written in index.js or referred to will get bundled up and put into the um, the bundled version of the same thing. Um, so at, at the moment, all it does is um, it prints a message to the console, I think. Um, for now it should be like that, which is a placeholder provided by Packer. Um, we can import functions from one script to another. So yeah, that index.js is calling code that is in a JS module and um, also importing the shiny JavaScript package. Um, yeah, we don't actually need to know about that. Um, so we need to import framework seven. So we'll add that. Oh, done it twice. Um, then we import the CSS whose assets are located in the node module framework seven. So we're importing the bundled framework seven styles. So yeah. 
Mm -hmm. So these file paths are relative to to where are we? Node modules. To that directory, node modules. So there should be a framework seven. Dash framework seven dot min dot bond or something like that. Okay, so we've added that. Um, yeah, we've not imported any components, and what we want to do in this app is add a slider so that the user can set that mu parameter, and we also want to um, demonstrate. I, you know, like kind of um, send notifications to the user as well. So we're going to import this range thing to use as a slider and this toast thing to use for notifications. Um, and that goes in index.js as well. Um, so here, this is now we're adding an app to we're adding a framework 7 based app and that's going to go into the index.js as well right i think we can get rid of the shiny app custom message app. so Now, what have I missed here? Is there anything? Yeah, so we talked about Framework 7 apps um, a, f a few weeks ago. You've got here, we've got an element that it's going to look for on the page that, that this script gets loaded into. And when it finds that element, it will inject the app component into it. We've just seen in the user interface that we've added an an element with an ID that matches that. So this div is going to get this app injected into it. Um, oh yeah, and it does warn you that like if you have to change this identifier, uh, sorry, if you have to change this identifier, then you should also change this identifier so it knows where to. Look. Anyway, um, right. Okay, so we've not talked about components really yet, um, and um, so there is source JS. If I make a um, L targets the app ID. If you ever have to change blah, blah. right? So. We're going to be populating a file called app.f7.jsx. We're going to be writing some JSX code that will define our application, and that will get imported into index.js, I think. I think that's right, at least. Um, those component files should return a function. So the functions look like this. So what this will return here is a function that takes no arguments and returns a, um, well, the, the, the kind of converted version of this JSX stuff. So it will basically make an unordered list. Um, I don't know if the list thing is actually used in the um in the, the the actual application that we're working towards um uh yes so you could decompose this even further if you wanted so you could have a list item reflecting um uh, so this code here could be extracted out into another file if you wanted. And then in 
list.f7, you could import that list item thing. Um, I don't think either is actually necessary for the app, so we'll not do that. But this is the preliminary main app component. So what we're going to do is define it, and there's some content that needs filling in eventually. Seven. Seven. Okay. Now, what? So, yeah. So we've got a title here and we've got some content that's going to get injected into here. Eventually, we're going to be um, make, making that content a bit fuller. It doesn't use that list thing, does it? No. Um, right. So I think we're at the stage where we can bundle this. Dollar F seven. Where's that? I think that's in the subsequent code. Let's try bundling this. No. What's missing? Oh, seven bundle is not. Oh, right, okay. Okay, let's have a see what's gone wrong. Um, 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 when it works, seven dash bundle dot min dot CSS. Next five. Oh, that's weird. None of them are being exported properly. There must be something about how we've specified the um, imports. Seven slash ESM components. And in here, it's uh, no uh, the import frame seven. That's weird. All of those files are available, um, but for some reason they're not. Oh no, ESM. There's no ESM thing. Is it just components now? Components of range. We've got three errors. Range such as it's not exported. Hey. I don't think I'll get past that. Um, maybe if I... Um, how can I do this? I could probably... No, actually, I don't think... I'm not sure what to do about this. This is like um, an inability to import the um, the script from a package that we have installed as a dependency. Um, if I get the, the package.json from the original version of this app that um, that's on GitHub somewhere, I, I don't think it would improve matters. 
Hold on, let me config. This is what time. Hmm. That's a shame. I thought that was going to... I thought that would work. Um, yeah, I'm a bit scuppered now. Uh, yeah, with an extra hour yesterday, I could have I could have probably debugged this. Um, right. Um, ah, what a way to end the book. <laughs> um, right. How do you uh, export? Import that. That may be this is something. Maybe. I thought there might be a config that forgotten to set uh time's up <laughs> oh, i love doing these these kind of like um uh demos that never quite work um right anyway so so the aim there the aim there was to demonstrate the um the uh, seamlessness with which you can integrate um existing javascript um libraries with your own bespoke code that you know may include some of these like byzantine javascript syntaxes like jsx or um or the the newer javascript um syntax uh, and from that collection of things build a um build a javascript file that can be sent over to the browser and which will support the um code in your 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 shiny application so either but providing the user interface or uh for the e charts thing that we, i think it would have been quite lucky if we'd got to um providing you know interactive graphics and, and things um <sighs> yes uh so anyway um it's i mean it's it's it was an interest. I've read the chapter a couple of times, so I should really have worked through the whole uh, thing. But like, I I figured from having the R code in place, I thought the JavaScript would go a bit easier than it did. Um, is there any specific things that we ought to mention? Um, this gives us twenty-eight six. Okay, yeah. Um that's a shame. I thought the um because the 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 JS syntax is actually quite nice in this section where we're just doing the framework seven stuff. Um but yeah, so Packer exists. It has um templates that you can add on to a golem app it has templates that you can add on if you're making html widgets or something like that and um so if you've got an r package that you're working on 
be it an app or a, um, a, a widget or something, Packer can integrate with that quite nicely. Um, something that has gone wrong as far as getting the dependencies and uh, included in the um, the front end code that I'm working through, but I'm sure I'll be able to find out what's gone wrong there. Um, yeah, uh, but I think it's it's a neat tool. The end of the JavaScript for our book has like four chapters on um, not just on Packer, on Webpack and bundlers in, in general and um, introduces a, a, a kind of slower pace the the tools that Packer provides. Um, yeah. Uh, anyway, that's, that's a shame, but that's how it goes sometimes with the demos. Um, so this has been a very long year of learning um, um, the UI side of the shiny world. Um, we have worked through a book that, yeah, so the, there are the the book takes us through a kind of summary of uh, just web applications in general, things like web sockets and stuff like that that are relevant to Shiny. It took us through, you know, the basics of like CSS and um, SCSS, is it, or SAS or whatever it was called, um, for alternative syntaxes for generating CSS. Um, quite a bit on JavaScript as a just a, a general language and how to integrate it with with apps, and then how to make these HTML templates available to Shiny applications. So things that we've looked at were Framework Seven, which was used in the Shiny mobile package. We also looked at um, what was the other one? It was um, oh, I can't remember now. Um, anyway, um, yeah, integrating JavaScript with shiny applications, building out things like input handlers and 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 whatnot. Um, so yeah, it's I mean it's been a valuable book. A lot of the examples I, I I found a little bit challenging and there there were some assumptions that I I, I didn't meet that um I think uh the, the author probably kind of made but um but overall it's been quite valuable but I, I, I think I need a little bit of a rest from book clubs right now. Uh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, well, yeah. if you want to like in a more compact form i, I don't know if Tre trevin uh, may have attended this but at the posit conf uh, uh there, there's actually a session led by david and, and i think uh maya um that okay. was a little bit like around this so may, maybe it's like a up, updated and or synthesized version of the book i mean Ooh, for my own cool. part i'm i'm looking forward to coming back to these chapters as as so like this is a nice overview, but I, I, it so happens like not too much of it was immediately relevant for me. Yeah. But I definitely see some use cases for like I'm going to come back to this book for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I to be honest, at the moment, I for for a lot of it, I'm in a a place where I I think I think I'll make a few mistakes if I'm to uh, Im implement some of the things that are kind of described in this book. Uh, at present um you know if i if i needed to take a you know i uh, uh, you know at present i don't think i'd be able to do the make like a shiny bulma package or whatever it was that absalon released recently um but i think it it has helped kind of work out some of the basics but i i think i i I think I would struggle if I was to attempt to do anything like some of the projects that are described in this in this book at, at the moment. Um, but yeah, 
it's quite, quite cool. I do like learning this kind of browser side stuff because it's it's really not my expertise at all. So it's quite useful as a kind of shiny developer to kind of challenge what you good at i guess we'll see how the world changes too with the advent of uh <laughs> yeah, shiny exactly. live and uh well, and i guess yeah. maybe like wasm more more broadly yeah i wonder how many books are being rushed out at the moment on those <laughs> topics um i'm sure we'll not be shy of a um further stuff for shiny book clubs in the future but uh yeah uh, it, it will be a long time till till i'm uh uh, doing them ones i think cool anyway thanks both of you for for coming along to um the the meetings up until the the very end week um i know that it's a, a significant amount of your time to devote to to this kind of stuff so i i really do hope it's been valuable to you and you know some of the other book clubs that we've done um and uh although fermi as well who who isn't here uh, hasn't been here for a month or two, but um, was present for a lot of the um, first half of the book. Anyway, brilliant. Uh, I will not see you next week. <laughs> 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 Enjoy. <laughs> I'm going to have to head off. Thanks again, Russ. Yeah, and you, and you, and you. Yeah, thanks for uh, shepherding us through this. <laughs> all right, all the best. And Take you. care. See you later.